Thank you, Sister Melissa, for bringing that to our attention. Tonight we're going to be looking at Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 5. This will be our 61st lesson in Ephesians. Now, for those of you that are with us for the first time, this is a time when you can provide input. You can participate with the comments that you have. We do ask they be insightful, you know, comments appropriate. And you'll have the benefit, just raise your hand, we'll, so we'll recognize you, so you can be a part of this. Amen. Also, if, uh, if we're going through this, if something is not clear to you, and you you feel as though you need to know right away a little more information, well, don't hesitate to let that be made known. Amen. Now, we're, this, frankly, the text we're going to be dealing with tonight is a hard text to teach. Not because it's hard to believe or anything like that, but... I suppose there's a sense in which there's other things that we'd <laughs> like to talk about, but unfortunately the Lord doesn't give you that, that opportunity to just pick out what you'd like to talk about. Because God is interested in more than you. There's other people, of course. Then there's himself. There's his son. There's angels and principalities that he's teaching. Mm -hmm. There's the Holy Spirit that's working for him. <laughs> See, there's a lot involved with the things of God. So the, the New Covenant does not place an accent on what you don't do. People call it a negative. I, kinda, I don't really like that word, but for one of another one, there's there are a lot of things you you can't do, and you're not to do. But that's not the thrust of the New Testament. That's not the the emphasis of salvation in Christ Jesus. But it is there, and it cannot be ignored at all. So we're we're going to have to deal with some of those things tonight. There are things like things you have to. It's a text Ephesians that said put off. You got them. Maybe they haven't expressed themselves outwardly, but you've got them. Put them off. They put off the old man. That's the call it the Adamic nature, the sinful nature, the flesh, the part of you that's not born again. You say, well, I thought I was all born again. Look at your body. Come on now. Look at your body. It's not born again, is it? No. It's going to be. Amen. And you've got a rational part of your being, an emotional part of your being that hasn't been born again. It's got to be controlled. It can go up. It can go down. You know, the psalmist said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou cast down? See, your soul can get cast down. The part of you that born again, technically, it's your spirit. Amen. Or you might call your heart. It would be called in Scripture. So put off that part of you that has a line back to Adam. There's a part of you that you can trace back to Adam. But there's a part of you, praise God, you can't trace back to Adam. It's traced back to Christ. <laughs> that's the part that's emphasized. Put off the old man. He said, put off anger, wrath, malice. That's all get you back attitude. Blasphemy. That's derogatory speech. Filthy communication out of your mouth. See? Put that off. And the scriptures also talk about put away, like thrust it from you. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice, put it away. Then there's some texts that say abstain. Abstain from fornication, abstain from all appearance of evil, abstain from fleshly lusts at war against the soul. See, there are things you abstain. You just have to abstain from them. 
And there are things you're not to be. Some be nots. Be has to do with what you are. See, there's a difference between be and do. <laughs> Some people emphasize what you do. But see, God emphasizes what you be or what you are. Amen. What you are determines what you do. <laughs> so here's some things that are not to be. Be not high-minded. That means you think more of yourself. You compare yourself with somebody else. You say, well, I'm pretty, I rank pretty high. Well, that's just because you're, you're comparing with your sinful peers. Be not high-minded. <coughs> be not conformed to this world. It'll try and conform you. Yeah. Try and press you and be like us. You just say, no. Yeah. I've seen how you are. I don't want to be like you. Yeah. That's yeah. what you got to just come right out and say it sometimes. Yeah. Be not wise in your own conceits. That is, maybe you're a gifted thinker or something, but you still need, you still need the Lord. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference how high your IQ is. IQs don't impress heaven. That's just something on earth that they'll put on paper to impress you, but that's not what God looks at. B, be not wise, only conceits. Be not overcome of evil. Oh, that's a, that's a good. Evil doesn't only mean moral evil. Sometimes it can be like calamity, like a tornado. Hmm? Some people's faith deepened in the tornado. Some people's faith flew away. Yeah, that's right. They were overcome. See, overcome by evil. Be not overcome by evil. Be ye not the servants of men. See? Yeah. Or be not children in understanding. Or be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. See, so there's, these are all what, we, what men would call negative, negative things. Now Paul knows that after him there's going to come an introduction of a new kind of Christianity. He called it a time when men would not endure sound doctrine. And they'd heap to themselves teachers after their own lust. That is, they say, if you just tell us what we want to hear, we'll make a megachurch for you. Oh, we will. We'll give you a lot of money. You could become a millionaire, maybe even a billionaire. If you just tell us what we want to hear. He knew that time was going to come. Some would depart from the faith. Give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And they would reshape men's thinking about Christianity. Now, we're living in a time like this. God has been re reshaped. The God of the American church isn't the God of the Bible. If you think it is, you just you just had to spend your son spend some time and look into this. There would be a God, there would be a God developed that would permit men to do things God really doesn't permit them to do. It'll make allowances that God doesn't make allowances for. God says, stop. And this new form of religion says, taper off, yeah, yeah. Yeah. cut back, mm -hmm. try and control it. See, the Bible says, don't be angry. The world says, manage your anger. See, that's, that's not the same thing. That's right. So a different, different kind of concept. We've all been subjected to it. Some have recognized it, some haven't. But if you think about it, you'll recognize it. If you're, if you're scripturally literate, it all depends on that. How much you understand and know about the Word of God, you will know that the God this book talks about is not the God that's being talked about on the TV and in the media. It's not the same God. It's not the same Jesus. It's not the same Gospel. It's not the same Spirit. You say, well, that seems kind of radical to me. Well. 2 Corinthians 11.4 says that this actually happened at Corinth in the first century. He said they, heard, they bought into another, another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. 
Well, they thought it was the real one. But always, these other, other Christs, other gods, other spirits, they always allow men to do more than God allows them to do. That's, that's the kind of the, the trait of this God. Now, Paul is addressing the whole body of Christ, not only the one in his time, but for all time. So he's going to reiterate some things God, under no conditions, will tolerate. And these are things like you go to hell for. That's right, yeah. These are things that if you do them, you've got to repent of them. You've got to recover yourself. You've got to get back to God, or you will be damned. Yeah. That's that. Amen. You know, I, I frankly don't enjoy talking like that. But uh, it has to be said, he's going to talk. He's going to talk like that. <coughs> Paul is accenting the various involvements, interpersonal involvements that defile a person. He knows that in this, and remember, there's a lot, the King James Bible says, ye. All right, that's the plural of you. Now, see, other modern versions don't say that. So you never know if you're talking about one person or a billion persons. You, you have no idea when you read you. English word you doesn't distinguish. See, what this, this does. He's talking about ye, that, the, the con congregation as a whole. Now, Satan throws fiery darts at you personally, but he does at congregations too. He tries to make inroads into churches or congregations or fellowships or however you want to... Stay that he's alerting them. He's alerting them to this. You've got to come to the point where you can distinguish between the wooing of the spirit and the allurement of the world. Yes. You've got to get to the point where you can tell what's what. Amen. Whether it's the lust of the flesh. Or it's a desire of the spirit. You've got to be able to distinguish that. So he helps to helps us to identify it. Here's our text. It's Ephesians 2, 3 through 5. <clears throat> but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become a saints. Neither foolish filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. Now, I want to emphasize that he's talking about the assembly. Now, this applies to the individual, too, because what applies to the individual also goes down, to the assembly, also goes down to the individual. But he's particularly emphasizing the, uh, the assembly and what goes on there. See, when the assembly, for instance, becomes like a session of entertainment, now this is very serious. Mm -hmm. This is a very serious thing. Because God is not in the entertainment business. See, the whole concept of entertainment is to get you to turn away from reality as something that really isn't. Yeah, that's right. And kind of make you get a break from the reality of life. That's the whole concept behind entertainment. Mm -hmm. that's not, I'm not anti-entertainment. <laughs> I'm not anti-entertainment, I understand. But when it comes to the body of Christ, when it comes to what you do in the name of the Lord, yeah. entertainment's out. Yeah. Amen. Why? Because you can fake it. Yeah. Uh -huh. you, can, you can act it out and not really... Mm -hmm. In fact, I hesitate to mention it, but I think it will anyway. In fact, a local congregation had three Hollywood actors yeah. come and read portions of Job to the congregation these three weren't even Christians, and they told what they were going to accent, and it wasn't even right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. But it yeah. brought a lot of interest, you know. Now let's look at this text. But let's look at the word "but." It's an important word. There's an actual Greek word for "but." But some other versions read "so that." And we left off by reading, that's where we left off, verse 32 of 4. 4, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ hath forgiven you. And simultaneous, 
I say simultaneously with doing that, you got to do this other two. You got to do the positive and the negative at the same time. Amen. It's like your battery. Both poles have to function if the thing's going to run. Right. Both poles have to function at the same time. Yeah. This is what he's going to emphasize. See, now you, the new creation is versatile. Your faith is very capable. You can do a lot more than you think. I know there's one people, but one, one, one thing people. They could do one thing and they're an idiot and everything else. I understand that that kind of condition exists. And I don't want to sit in judgment on that. But when you come in the kingdom of God, that's not the way it is. You may see this guy over here, he looks like a hobo. You think, who is that? He says, well, my name's Albert Einstein. See, but that kind of stuff is not in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God coordinates the human personality. Doesn't allow for these divergences. But he's going to so the butt is like a hand that reaches out and takes hold of this walk in love and it takes hold of this and it takes hold of that. You do both things at the same time. But connects two thoughts together. Be followers of God. Walk in love. And put off these things here. All. Don't think that when you're busy doing the work of God, Satan goes home to lunch. Yeah. That's right. Amen. He's going to pick up his activity. He's going to pick up his attempts. Yeah. So you've got to learn to press forward and use the seal of faith at the same time. You've got to learn to pray with thanksgiving and resist the devil at the same time and give thanks and, and perceive the things of God at the same time. See, you've got to learn to do this at the same time. And you can, and God tells you this because he's like prodding the new creation to come alive and begin to work. In other words, you can't follow God and at the same time not love the brethren. Yeah. Or you can't love the brethren and not put off these various sins that he mentioned. See, they all they have to be done simultaneously. Put off now fornication. It, it is admittedly a sensitive subject. But now the world has taken this thing too far. It's time the church for the church to speak up right. about this. Now some versions try and explain it in view of modern society. They say immorality. Well, that's Morality has to do with doing right or wrong. It's more, something that's moral is something that has a right and a wrong side, and you've got to choose one or the other. Immorality is the wrong side. The NIV reads sexual immorality. The basic Bible reads evil acts of the flesh. God's Word Bible says sexual sin. Murdoch, an ancient translator, said whoredom. The New Jerusalem Bible says sexual vice. Webster's Bible says lewdness. The Living Bible says sex sin. Apostolic Bible says harlotry. Contemporary English Bible says immoral. See, there's different... It's a hard subject to talk about. Now, we just have to be... <laughs> Fornication is not a thought. It's a deed. Amen. See, covetousness is in the mind. Fornication is in the body. It's a bodily thing. See, what about, see, commit adultery with her in your own heart? Yeah, but you didn't say fornication. Fornication is a broader term. It's a bodily action. Now, these various sins involved in fornication are spelled out under the law. I gave you the text in Leviticus. It's remarkably detailed. Everybody should become familiar with it. It has to do with man and woman and man and man and woman and woman and people with beasts. It spells it all out. What fornication is. So by the law is a knowledge of sin. So if you don't really want to know what this is, the law defines it. Spells it out for you. The apostles don't. They rely on that the law said it. And you don't want to spend a lot of time in the definition, just, just enough so you get the point across, because there are certain words when you use them, you wake up. Yeah, 
it's like you know, brother Boris Moten said one time, I, I want to, I want to make sure that nobody thinks about lemon pie. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going to learn this chorus. Don't think about lemon pie. You know. So what happens when you take a group of teenagers off for studies and what we're talking about? You wake up. That's what Paul said. He says, I was uh, alive once without the law, but sin, the law came, sin revived. Just the mention of the nomenclature awakens this. That's why we have to be very careful how we talk about it. That's part of why this is so hard, <laughs> hard to teach about. Now, in the world, ancient cultures deified lust. And there are a number of gods and goddesses that were promoted this kind of activity. And I named some of them here. There's an amazing, amazing, uh, amazing number of them that they emphasized promiscuity and immorality. And they had idols where an act of worship was these kind of deeds. In fact, they, the Nicolaitans which I mentioned in the book of Revelation, there was a church there that had some people attending that held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans were guilty of promiscuity. And they taught that if you had this desire, the desire came from God and it should be fulfilled. That was their doctrine. They taught this as some people at Pergamos bought into it. And Jesus spoke pretty frankly with them about it. This is the... Yes. Now we are in this kind of culture. You will hear someone say, well I noticed that you two are together. Yes, we've been together for 15 years and we've been married five years. And they just... This is just the way people talk. Particularly in the entertainment world and political world. This is how they talk. But this is serious business. It all promotes this fornication. So he mentions this. This is something that is not once to be named. There's, God does not allow for one of these acts. So what if a person does it? All right, there's forgiveness. We, we'll tell you that right up front. You, you, and you better repent and be the path to God while you can. And you better never do it again. Amen. You see, how do you know what Jesus told that woman taking any act of adultery? Remember that? Uh -huh. He said, go your way and oh, sin no more. Amen. Now with that word, there went some power. Yeah. You understand? You've got to really yeah. see this. That yeah. When he says sin no more, he empowers the individual to say no and not to be in that, mm -hmm. that trap again. Time you, you brought out that the reason the Lord doesn't show us where there's a line because flesh will go right up to that line. That's right. Say, well, I'm just going to stop Amen. right at the line. Well, we don't know where the line is. You yeah. No one knows where you've gone too far. That's right. If you have time now, stop whatever you're doing and yeah. turn to the Lord. Yeah, if you, if you just know the way the scriptures talk about this and you hear this word used or you hear something like it, it just throws off some sirens in your spirit. Watch out. This, this is dangerous stuff. And by all means, you don't want to be a person who's entertained by seeing this on the media. Because <laughs> the media will, will attempt to bring it in your house and entertain you with this. And what will it do? It'll wake up that part of you that maybe it's never been woke up before, but it's there. Fornication, all uncleanness. Now that's a word you don't hear a lot about today. Uncleanness, but there's considerable about it in the scriptures. One place in Second Corinthians six, he says, "Touch not the unclean thing." You would see unclean. What does that mean? Unclean, all uncleanness. Some versions say impurity, indecency. If you look etymologically, the word means 
physical in a moral sense, impure, lustful. It even means luxurious or profligate. There are some things that being around them contaminates you. Now, it's true in nature, you know, you're around a skunk, everybody knows. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they say, ah, see you, got, see, you got too close to the skunk there, I can tell. <laughs> or someone's been drinking a lot, you know, they get, you are. Oh, yeah. And sometimes, did you know, I will share this, Brother Bob, with you. Brother Bob's mother, her husband, who finally did come to the Lord, but he was a heavy smoker, three and a half packs a day. He's passed away now. And so she lived in a house where there's a lot of smoke. She went through nicotine withdrawal. Literally. Through nicotine withdrawal because she was around it. Well, that's a picture of a spiritual environment. If you say, I'm going to go down to the bar and I'm going to witness down there, huh? I don't recommend this. I do. I did it one time when I was young. I preached in bars, and finally, I said, "I got to go outside and preach into the bar. I can't. I can't go in it." But there's environments that defile you, make you unclean, and there's deeds that have a lasting impact, corrupt you, and have a lasting. Fornication is one of those. It just has a. You can't get away from it. You live with something for a long time. All uncleanness. The Message Bible, speak, no, it's uh, the uh, unclean, it says one, impure, impure lusts. This is a class of transgression, there is a class of transgression that has defiling effects. Yeah, that's right. All uncleanness, that covers it. And uh, covetousness. Some other versions read greed, desire for others' property. Unbridled lust, avarice, desire for wealth, selfishly wanting more and more. Message of Phillips Bible says the itch to get your hands on what belongs to other people. In a nutshell, covetousness, which is called idolatry, the next verse, is not being content with what you have. And you want more than it apparently you can handle. And sometimes you'll see what someone else has and you want that. That's covet. And the law spells out the details of covetousness. In Exodus 20, verse 17, it says, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So see, it spells it out. You may live next to a person that, you know, has some things you'd like to have. you got to you got to put the damper on that. Amen. You get out of control. Uh -huh. This would be all the way from wanting a job like he's got, wanting a house like he's got, car like he's got, wife like he's got. You know, just covetousness. He says, now don't let this be once named. Other versions say, here's the NIV, there must not even be a hint of it. <laughs> Here's a new revised standard verse. Must not even be mentioned among you. The Jerusalem Bible says it should not even be mentioned. The whole Christian standard Bible says it should not be heard of. Let no man be able to accuse you, the living Bible says. And don't let it be said that, said that any of you were this. So there's two two sides to this. First, no one's to be guilty of these sins. They must they must not be committed by any members of God's church. They must not. Not even one time. Now it's not our business to say, aha you did it, that's it for you. That that's out of our that's another matter. Now we're talking about stopping it from happening. Amen. Now he's given you the whole armor of God to help you do this. Amen. Huh? Amen. 
The whole armor of God has been given to you to protect you and stop you from doing this. He's given you the Holy Spirit to strengthen you not to do it. He's given you access to God so you can obtain grace to help in the time of need. He's got all, a lot of advantages now for it not once to be named. But there's very few churches that can say it's never been named. These things have never been named once. There's very few. And we don't sit in judgment on them. Understand, we're just saying it does take effort to do this. That's why so much is given to us to help us not to do this. Don't let us be one. So you first got to determine, yes. I'm not going to do this. Amen. But it doesn't end there. Then you've got to go to the Lord and appropriate resources not to do it. You may be living, you may be living in Las Vegas. We lived in, in Chicago. That was different than living in Joplin, let me tell you. Joplin's doing his best to catch up, though. But there's some environments that you... You have to be on guard now. Amen. Chicago was an entertainment and athletic center of the world. Weekends, nobody's thinking about God or Christ. Yeah. They were down at the ball. They had all five sports there, you know. That, that's the way they were. So you had to be on guard in those environments. Mm -hmm. They did not once be named among you. So first of all, first of all, no single person is to be guilty of this. Second of all, no, no congregation is to have these kind of people, which means you've got to teach, you've got to supply resources, you've got to expound the scripture so that it has the net effect of discouraging this kind of thing from, from rising. You can't cast your attention like on growing a, growing a larger body of people or having a new parking lot. You can't put your attention on lesser things. See, you've, you've got to preach and teach so that always this is always kept alive in people's minds. And it, it, can't be more, it can't be like a crushing law mentality. It can't be that. It has to be, it has to be taught so you see that the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is what we're talking about here. It's more than just abstaining from this or that. It's alive. It's alive and it... And it and it strengthens you, and, and, and you anticipate more. You want more. That's right. Huh? He instills that in you and changes your nature to desire these things. That's exactly right. And you just want more and more. That, that's the function of a legitimate church. That's what it's doing. It's feeding the flock of God. And that's what you do here. <laughs> You have really to let that ministry speak for itself. <laughs> yes. Earlier you mentioned the nomenclature, just uh -huh. words that arouse the lust of the flesh. Uh -huh. But the Lord has his spiritual nomenclature also. That's you know, right. Certain yes. words that carry great amounts of truth. Yes. And right. that's, that's the type of words we want to incorporate in these meetings uh -huh. and in our fellowship, yes. mm -hmm. in the ministry that we have to the saints, so that it'll awaken the spiritual mm -hmm. appetites and, yes. and desires. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of us have confessed that we were in Christ a long time before we heard of some certain things, yes. yeah. before we heard very much about them. Right. The emphasis was on something else. But thank the Lord he led us to one another too. Yeah. Receive and see these things and have more understanding. That's right. Amen. Given last night we were talking about marked well for bulwarks. Oh, yes, and uh, it, this was, you know, this in this context that there's certain things, there's certain environments that, that they'll make a strong appeal to your flesh. But see, if you've marked well the bulwarks of Zion, you'll know where to flee. You'll flee into the Lord. You, You'll you commit yourself. So you'll be able to, in times of trouble, you'll be able to to, to safely hide yourself in, That's in right. Christ and, and seek Him. Um, because you, you, if you can get your mind to thinking about uh, godly things, eternal things, you know, even in the midst of these troubles, you, they'll rescue you. God's Word will rescue you from these kind of these troubling Amen. times. The things of God are superior. Amen. Amen. They are superior. The things of God and the things of the devil are not like co-equal. The things of God are superior. So that the things of God squash the things of the devil. But they, they have to be summoned to a place of priority. They have to be brought to the front part of your mind, so to speak. And then they subdue this other. You see. 
competing environments of the world, yeah. the present world and the world to come, if we if we emphasize this, the, the things uh, concerning the truth, so that those who love the truth and receive the love of the truth will be will be strengthened and fortified. Uh, they'll be fed, as has been mentioned, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then. If, if any come in, if any pretenders come in, mm -hmm. yeah. if any who don't love the truth come in, mm -hmm. then that environment will automatically sift them out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because they will see, they may uh -huh. not talk about it, but they will see, I can't live both places. Yeah. Yeah. I can't have both things, uh -huh. and this is what I love, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It will be a great protection for us. Yes, yeah. amen. There's something else to know too about the things of God. Now when you're ministering the things of God, or preaching the gospel, or speaking on the edification, or making the knowledge of God known, however you state it, it doesn't make any difference where you are. You're here, you're in Africa, you're in Pakistan, you talk the same. That's right. That's but when you speak about things related to the earth, when you're here, you talk differently than you do in a poverty-stricken nation. That's right. yeah. You don't talk about TV and cars when you're in Pakistan. Right. You, you have to talk differently when you think about the things of the world. But when you're talking the things of God, it's a universal, Amen. universal language. Amen. Everybody needs this. Yes. Right. And it's stated the same way to everybody. Amen. But it's, it, this is like a marvelous liberty. Amen. Let it not once be named among you as becomes saints. Saints, of course, means holy ones. Holy means separated to God and pure. You belong to God exclusively and you're uncontaminated with the world. There's a certain manner of life and speech that's comely to God's people. Some people who have a good family name, they'll admonish the children, like, don't, don't put a smudge mark on the family name. Yeah, they, that used to be kind of a little more less popular today, but there'd be name, family names that were noted for piety and godliness and so forth, and so they would tell the children to give honor to the name. Much more the name of the Lord. Amen. Much more the name of the Lord. As confirmed to the epistle to the Corinthians, those who refuse to do what he said here have to be purged from the church. Yeah. Amen. It's 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. And he, he mentions fornication in particular, but he mentions these other sins too. They have, why? Because a little leaven yeah. leavens the whole lump, because it will grow. Yeah. If they had not expelled that fornicator who did repent and come back, yeah. then pretty soon we'd have had two fornicators and then four fornicators, and see. So the body body, the church, which is the body of Christ, that body trumps the individual. Amen. That's right. The bodily interests supersede individual interests. That doesn't mean neglect. It just means if there's a harm to the body, we don't think about the individual anymore. Because for an individual who is in the church, to give themselves over to sin, they have had to quench the spirit, grieve the spirit, forget God, forget heaven, forget they're going to die, forget the day of judgment. See, they had to do all that before they did it. So they've already went past a lot of fences. And who knows how many warnings they had inside from God saying, don't draw back, draw back, don't do that. Don't. They may have had a thousand of them. That's why that kind of action is taken. It's not an act of hardness or callousness. It's, it's not that. It's concern for the body of Christ and knowing that you just don't drop off into sin accidentally. You have to be knocked off the path, start heading in another direction. And he continues this kind of talk. <laughs> Neither filthiness nor foolish talking or jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving a thanks. Yeah, it becomes more and more clear that the body of Christ must be noted for being holy. Now, if you were just to take a survey on the street, and some people have done this now, some people have done this, 
take a survey on the street of what the average person thinks about the church and nobody will give you a plus. Even the world knows. Something's wrong. It's beneath par. It's not up to the standard. It could be a lot better. They, well, see, this is not, this is not comely. This does not be, this is not becoming to God for his children not to be like him. Neither. Let's look at that word neither. It's the same uh, Greek word that started out the last sentence. It's one of those take hold of what was said, take hold of what is said, and do them, do them at the same time. Neither. So at the same time you're doing all this other stuff, putting off this other, at the same time you got to do this, put off filthiness. <laughs> Does this mean you don't wash your hands before you eat? Well, I won't. Not talking about that. We do recommend you do wash, <laughs> wash your hands, but that's not what he's what he's talking about here. Filthiness. It's it's get it's sloshing around in the muck and mire of the world, and the world gets all over you. That, that's what it boils down. To. There's there's some activities that you just have to kind of slop around in the world to do it, and it, 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 you get all sloppy and muddy and because of it. And uh, if it's something you you can't help, like your job or whatever, then you have to have, as Jesus said, your feet washed. Then you have to have, like, we, my mother used to call it a spit bath. You didn't, didn't have a whole bath, but you had to clean up the party it was defiled. That's what he cleanseth us from all sin. That's what that's talking about in 1 John 1, 7 through, 7 through 9. It's talking about this cleansing of this effects of being around the world. If you don't cleanse yourself from it, then you become filthy. Amen. There's a difference between having some filth on you and being filthy. There's a, <laughs> you can have filth on you and you can get it off of you by the grace of God, yeah. see? Amen. You can take care of that and go to bed spotless. Amen. Oh, I thank God for that. Amen. I wish I'd have known that a little bit sooner. I've known it for quite a few years now, but... I wish I'd have known it when I was a young man. Maybe I would have, wouldn't have gotten much trouble as I did. Filthiness. Filthiness is in, it's indecent is the idea. It's not appropriate. It's, it detracts. It detracts from what you are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes filthiness is you begin looking at things the way the world looks at it. Yeah, that's right. See, that, that's filth. That's, it doesn't mean yet at this. It doesn't mean you're filthy at that point. It means if you don't do something about it, that's the good news we give to people. <laughs> you, you can just browbeat people. Ah ha! Yeah, I see. There's a there's a speck in your eye. I see it now. Even instead of telling people, there's a. Let me tell you, how I can get that speck out of there. Yeah. Uh, that's what you want to do. Yeah. Then he may show you the log hanging out of your eye. Jesus said. It's used in scripture, it's indecent, something not appropriate. It's the world's way of looking at things. Sometimes uh, it can be the mouthing of foolish sayings and things like this that you have picked up, this bad thing. Foolish talking. This, this is amazing. Some people couldn't understand why does the Bible talk about stuff like this? Foolish talking. Some versions say silly talk. It's silly talk. Stupid talk. Words of folly. Foul talk. Flippant talk. Buffoonery. <laughs> it's a good, that's a good word. Buffoonery means foolish and playful. I guess. It's one kind of a form of jesting. We remember one of the little children in church fellowship here. She was somewhere around two, she couldn't really talk. Michael got to talking one day to her at the table. He said, She said, They talked for, well, see, that's silly talk. For Michael, it was silly talk. For her, well, it's the best, <laughs> the best she could do. But that's what silly talk is. It's talk that's unbecoming of a spiritually intelligent person. 
who has a grasp on the truth. It just it just doesn't make sense. Silly talk. Might be something like saying, uh, "God loves everyone the same." Yeah. And you got to explain Judas, and you got to explain Cain, and it's a whole bunch of you got to explain the world of Noah's day and uh -huh. silly talk. See, it's just silly talk. Or. Uh, Maybe someone says, well, we think that God casts a vote for you, the devil casts a vote for you, and you cast a deciding vote. Silly talk. You should know without being told that God's the one that casts a deciding vote. I mean, who doesn't, like, know this? If God doesn't receive you, it doesn't make any difference what you did. And he tells you upon what basis he will receive you, sir. You know, all sectarian... Dogma, things that make churches different, uh -huh. it's all foolish talking. Uh -huh. Amen. That's, what, that's why they can frame a denomination around uh -huh. a doctrine. When God, he includes all the saints. Yes. And yeah, what he says. Or jesting. Go ahead. You know, one of the renewals, I can commenting on this um, foolish talking. Uh, I had written down with Brother Fred. And it was, you know, like six, six, seven hours, eight hours. And, and I got the renewal, and I saw you, and I said, we were so lucky. <laughs> and we were just going over, because we had to write with Brother Fred the whole time, and he was expounding Romans 8. And we were just on a mountaintop. And so I told him, again, I said, we're so lucky. And so he sat there, and he listened to me, you know, said the whole thing. And then he got up to walk away, and he said, the luck of the Lord be with you. <laughs> Well, what, see, what was that? Now, see, he had exhorted me to what I had said technically was foolish. Because he, but see, how uh, uh, this is what we can do for one another is yeah. kind of readjust our thinking. Yeah. And, but see, when you put it in that context, now mm. it became evident. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> then he mentions jesting. Some words that read coarse jesting or coarse joking or vulgar talk words said in sport scurrility that's offensively rude and abusive or suggestive talk it just it doesn't come right out and say but you you're left thinking think looking the wrong way and thinking the wrong thing see that kind of talk jesting as used in scripture jesting officially or lexically means pleasantry or humor, facetiousness, inappropriate jesting. Now, there's a lot of debate among Christian people about humor. Well, I remember when I was uh, at the school, local Bible college here, one of the professors said, well, God, as we all know, has a sense of humor. They said, where does, uh, where does it say that? I mean, when you speak for God, yeah. Yeah. when you say God is something, you better be able to support it. So where, yeah. where is that at? Well, it says God laughed. Well, that was that was a laugh of derision. It wasn't a laugh of humor. God wasn't ha ha because the world was being damned. Yeah, that's right. It was in derision. Mm -hmm. That is, the world said, we're going to cut our bands asunder. We're going to shake off God. And he just laughed in derision. I'm not saying humor's wrong, altogether wrong. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, humor opens a door mm -hmm. that sometimes you don't want open. Yeah. It appeals to the weaker mm -hmm. part of your makeup, your intellectual and emotional makeup. Mm -hmm. And so if you use it, you've got to, you've got to be wise about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've got to learn not to make humorous what is detestable. You know, you can't depict something as funny that God had condemns, like drunkenness. You know, this, you, you get, Brother Jeremy. There's something that's bothered me that's uh, more and more recently I've heard, uh, and in contemporary songs too, they, they talk about Jesus being a friend of sinners. This is the way they say it. Now, in the Bible, the only place it talks about Matthew 11, uh, yeah. 19, and Luke uh, 7, 34, but it's... It's not Jesus saying, I'm a friend of it's sinners. It says, they said, behold, a man gluttonous, a wine bibber, and a friend of publicans yeah. and sinners. That's what they said of Jesus. Yeah. No, I don't. 
know of anyone that says Jesus was gluttonous. You or wine bibber. Any any insightful person. Yeah, that's friend of sinners. That's what his enemies said. What they're trying to say is that sinners were comfortable. Nobody was comfortable with sinning no. around Jesus. Now they people, came to Jesus to be changed. Yeah, people can take this too far, I understand. But Jesus said, you're my friends if, if yep. you do whatsoever I command you. So it's, it's spelled out. Jesus came to bring salvation to sinners, but not as a friend. He came as a savior. There's a big difference between a savior and a friend. Because a, a savior is being driven by his agenda. Yeah. See, not by a mutual Amen. agenda. Jesting, which are not convenient. Which are not convenient. Not fitting. No, or out of place. It just doesn't. There's no place in a life lived for the Lord. There's no place that this these things fit in, handling. They're out of character. See, God never acts out of character. He never does something that's not like he really is. Now, some you can do things out of character. You can do things out of an impulse. You weren't thinking. You did something that really, if you thought about it, you wouldn't have done it. That's right. But God's not like this. Amen. And he exhorts you not to think, of, oh, is this appropriate? Will this leave the correct impression? Now, I say that knowing full well that there are some times you don't have time to think it out. Like if you're going to be angry, you don't have time to count to ten and log in a journal. I will not do this anymore t ten times. I mean, I understand that you, know, you have to act instantly, but you have to develop a sense. You have to sensitize your soul so you don't have to ask yourself these questions all the time. Automatically, you, you just think, is this right? Is this appropriate? You just, when you live by faith, this is just what you do. You've, I know you've experienced this already. Most all of you have experienced this already. You've lived long enough with the Lord that you, there's flags and alerts that you didn't like think the thing out. It just came to you that this, uh, I'm a little reluctant. I'm going to draw him back from this. That's your clue, see? Not... But what should you do <coughs> in place of all these things? What should you do? But rather, yeah. it's in place of this. Now, what would you say? Well, if you didn't know what the text here said, and someone said, oh, you have to put off all these things, not let these things be found in you, but rather than these things being found in you, here's what you should do. What would you say, you know? What do you, you think about it? Here's what he said. Give thanks. Give thanks. <laughs> now, why did he say that? All right, there's not any circumstance you will ever be in where you can't give thanks. Yes, amen. If you're in Christ, you can thank God He took your feet out of a, took you out of a horrible pit and set your feet on a solid rock and put a new song in your mouth, whether you're in bad times or good times. You can remember back when you first saw the light. Give thanks. See, you can give thanks under any and every circumstance. Give thanks. And there's a potency in thanksgiving. Give thanks. Then he has one final word here. For this ye know, that no harmonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let's look at this word for. For. For is grammatically an article of affirmation and conclusion, denoting truly, therefore, verily, as the case stands. So what he's saying is, now after I've told you all these things, here's the conclusion. I'm, this fact here I'm going to cite is why I said the other things. Uh, yeah. Can you see that? What I'm going to tell you now is why I told you these things are not permissible. Some would say, well, you don't do these things because of the command of God. That's why. God said not to do it, so you don't do it. Well, that's, that's true, but that's not the argument he uses here. <laughs> 
Here's the argument. He used, he used a something. You know this. Now you know this. These kind of people aren't going to heaven. That's kind of the bottom line. That's why I'm saying this, because we do want them to go. Yeah. That's why we're saying this. That's why we're saying we're not saying this to make somebody feel bad. We're saying this. This you know, you know, when you come into Christ, you like this grows on you. It's like a it's like a body of water that keeps expanding, getting bigger. But you know that these things we mentioned will keep a person out of heaven. They won't. These things aren't allowed in heaven because they're all defiling things and nothing defiling will enter will enter there. So this no there's this common knowledge among us. So these there are some things that all believers know, but some people don't know they know. <laughs> I told you though know, a hundred times, but my first wife who died, she knew how to swim. She's like an Olympic swimmer boy. She was like an Olympic swimmer in water up to here. She knew how to swim. She was on top of the water. But she didn't know. She knew how to swim, so when she swam over her head, she sank. She almost drowned in Lake Michigan. That lifeguard had to go out and rescue her. She didn't know. All right, there's some people who don't know. They know. They kind of haven't grown. This can be attributable to, attributable to several things. One is maybe they just haven't grown up enough to know. Another is maybe they haven't thought enough about it. But that's why we say these things. We don't bank on everybody just knowing this and everybody just remembering it and so forth. Because you can know this right now and in the morning it gets away from you. Some circumstance comes up and it gets away from you. So we... We rehearse these things one another. You know, common knowledge. Anyone exposed to sound doctrine, they know this, that all these things exclude people from the kingdom of God. That makes them serious. Yes, amen. That means we don't want anyone to explain to us why they did it. We want to explain to them why they don't have to do it. They don't have any inheritance. And see, the inheritance for, for those in Christ, the inheritance is everything. Amen. The inheritance is the, at the culmination. This is the grand ramp up when you. It's what it's all about. So if you don't get the inheritance, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference what else you did or what else you had. If you don't obtain the inheritance, your total life was vain, pointless. Was no reason for it at all. You're all excluded. Note that covetousness is equated with idolatry too in this text. You see, what does that mean? You make yourself your own god. See, you're you're serving yourself. Yes. That's idolatry. The kingdom of well, like we says, the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now this is the same kingdom as the kingdom of God. The same kingdom. Same kingdom as the kingdom of heaven, which is Matthew's. Terms the same kingdom as the kingdom of God's dear son. It's the same kingdom as the kingdom of their father. Same kingdom as his kingdom. Same kingdom as the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the same kingdom. It's the it's God's kingdom because he owns it. It's the king by heaven because that's where the headquarters are, where it's administrated from heaven. It's an everlasting kingdom because it's never had a beginning or end yes, amen. at all. It's the kingdom of Christ because he's the administrator of the kingdom. It's the kingdom of Christ and God because it's God and God has given the kingdom to Christ. And then Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 27, says Christ is going to give it back to God yes. uh -huh. at, after everything's been concluded. So it's the kingdom of Christ. And God didn't relinquish the kingdom. He then turned the administrative function of the kingdom over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So to have no part in the kingdom, what that equates to being damned. That equates to being punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. 
That equates to being cast into the lake of fire. That equates to being having their part in the lake of fire. It's the same as being ascribed to tribulation and anguish upon every soul. It's the same as being cast into a furnace of fire. It's the same as everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, it's all talking about the same thing, but looking at it from different perspectives. So it is a, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to announce this, and it brings gladness to my heart that nobody has to go to hell. <laughs> just, and that's a piece of good. That's the good news we bring, that God has provided a way out of this dilemma. And he tells you. He gives you all the information right up front. Now, you've all, I'm sure, been taken in by people who, who got their hook in your nose, and you found out they didn't tell you the whole story about what they sold you on. You found out it wasn't what, what but God's telling you the whole story. Yep. Amen. So now, these things here, I'm telling you to abstain from them, and if the thing is too hard, I'm not going to let you into heaven if you do them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then the good man of God will tell them, that we've got this whole armor of God. Yeah. We've got this access to God. We've got an intercessor in heaven. We've got an intercessor inside you, the Holy Spirit making intercession for us. So we've got a lot of things going for you. If you have sinned, we've got an advocate with the Father. So everything's been provided for you to meet Amen. these conditions and have an abundant entrance yes. in the everlasting kingdom. Now, I am thankful that God has said it this way. I, just, I can only speak for myself, but I need this kind of candidness. Amen. Yes. I, don't, I don't like pussyfooting around. I never did, and I don't like it at all, particularly when it comes to things of God. Mm -hmm. and, and God, in being straightforward, He's, he's gentle. Have you noticed that? How God, God is strong enough that He could just squash you like a bug. I mean, that'd be it. But he, He's demanding, but He's gentle. Now, now he is. <laughs> in this, he is gentle in his demands. I will gently lead those that are with young. See? Come and learn from me, Jesus. And my yoke is easy. Because it fits, that's why. And because he's on the other side of it. You're, not, you're, it's my, you're in his yoke, he's not in your yoke. <laughs> that good? You, you've heard the story, you know, about the ox that was out plowing and an eagle is part of this ox and a, a flea was sitting on the horns one of the horns of this ox and this eagle flew down and said what what are you doing said we're plowing <laughs> that's the way it is brother Amen. if you do these things here that we just read about Jesus was with you in the doing of them and he wants you to do them. So he, he's not looking for a reason to abandon you. He's looking for a reason to stay with you. I think I'll close there. Any of you have a word you'd like to add? Mr. Barbara? But rather, an excerpt that he put in here, that with every one of the temptations or the negative side, there is also the That's corresponding right. positive side. That's right. Not this, but rather much better and I was thinking yeah. kind of uh, putting this in parallel with children whenever children are extremely small you tell them don't do this it's just because they don't understand anything else they can't do that and when they get a little bit older they understand there's a reason yeah. they shouldn't do yeah. that and as they continue to grow then af after not doing it seeing the reason not to do it you have the promise of receiving the positive end of obeying that commandment Amen, Amen. Amen. Mm. Yes, we'll obey. You know, the beauty of the way that, that the Spirit penned this is that there's there's no provisions for boasting in the flesh. That's know? right. Amen. And that's, and that's a wonderful thing. Amen. That's a free thing. That itself could beat you down. So if any man glory, let him glory in the Lord. Yeah, that's right. Yes, Sister Tasha. The reason why these things are so um, heinous to the Lord is because it mars what God has established in the earth to be a shadow of Christ and His bride. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 
Yes, it's, it's a June. Uh, right in the middle of this, he said, you mentioned the but rather giving of thanks. Yeah. Uh, thankfulness has a lot of joy attached to it because it realizes the the good, the beneficence of the Lord toward us. But you have to be sober. Yeah. When I say sober, that doesn't mean necessarily somber. You yeah, know, it's it. it's not ridiculous, but it, it can be quite lively and quite quite full of joy and expectation, giving of thanks again. But you still have to have a sober mind in Amen. order to give thanks, not just parrot something or, or just say something mindlessly, but to really give thanks. You've got to know what God is doing and how that you are in a position of, of uh, being in His pleasure and will. Amen. Amen. Ricky? Yeah, I too wanted to comment on that, giving of thanks, because you said that the things of God really are superior yes. to the things of the world. Mm -hmm. And the thing about giving of thanks, what it does is it tunes the heart to behold the blessing of God. Mm -hmm. Because you're working out your salvation in this moral environment where yeah. Satan knows if you've got your eyes squarely fixed on the blessing of God, you are not about to give yourselves to these other Amen. things. Even having the vulnerability in your flesh, Amen. you are not about to do that. Mm -hmm. So he has to turn your attention yeah. away in order to make you vulnerable to do this. And so giving of thanks uh -huh. keeps you continually tuning mm -hmm. so that you Good. can continually behold the blessing Good. of God. And that's what fortifies you against sin. Good. Amen. Amen. And this is why it's so important, especially in the in the, in the gathering together of ourselves to do this because it creates the environment where you can uh, look to God and see these blessings of God and yeah. things because um, it, it strengthens you like Sister Julie said it gives you the strength to go on because you behold each person doing this individually mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the whole can do it together Amen Amen. Amen. Actually now he's speaking to the people he's speaking to those who have been delivered That's from right. these things That's right. That's giving right. thanks yeah. that, uh, that I'm not enslaved to these things well, actually That's these good. are warnings uh -huh. Now, brethren, we've been delivered from these things. Now, now, you know, if you get if you give yourself to these, you're going to be under bondage again. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. it's uh, mm. good. Mm. Put the pastor. Oh, sister Debbie. Yeah, I just on the heels of that. I was thinking that it's, it's the way we see that that God has devised these things for us because it's for our own good and benefit that we mm -hmm. make. Otherwise, we, you know, we would take them as a list of rules. Amen. Amen. Yeah, they're not luxuries, they're great benefits. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. John exhorts, the world is passing away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides for Amen. Amen. Yeah, I would think that um, if someone made a list of these things and they didn't tell you it was from the Scriptures, they might argue against some of these things being on the list. Like, what in the world? How are you mixing fornication with jesting? What does that have? But see, he says, in the context of what he's talking about, so nobody would ever say, but but God understands, he ends up with saying, these things will keep you out of heaven. Yes, right. I mean, you've got to look at them seriously, and the Holy Spirit yeah. knows how to minister these things to your heart yeah. to where you, 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 can, you can avoid them if you're serious. Amen. Amen. Right, we'll Brother Gibbon. Yes. Um, also, in this matter of giving thanks in Scripture, the Lord says, "In everything, give thanks." Um, there's also a mercy attending it, especially when we find ourselves in the midst of a trial or something that's distracting us. When you're truly thankful, mm -hmm. when you truly understand what you are thankful for, the mercy attending it is the thing that you're thankful for becomes your primary focus. And the things that were a weight to you or a distraction to you begin to fade. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessing tonight. We thank you for the truth. And then when we know it, it makes us free. We give you all the glory for what we are in Christ Jesus. And we're thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.